quickly return in your Bibles to Psalm 112. Let's read down through that, the first of, of total 10 verses. It says, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Goodwill will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. It's interesting, and if you have time and some time at home, if you read Psalm 111 and, and 112, they are very similar psalms. They both are acrostic psalms. In other words, they begin with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 lines here, and, and, the, and they follow through it one verse after another. So if you read verse 1 in Psalm 111 and then read, verse 1 in Psalm 112, read it down, both Psalms in, in, in continuity with each other. Psalm 111 celebrates God as Jehovah, and Psalm 112 celebrates the person who trusts in Jehovah. And so uh, the, the characteristics of God are mentioned in Psalm 111, and then in Psalm 112, the characteristics of the person who trusts in God are listed. In this morning's message, I want to just focus on verse 7. It says, They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Nobody likes, I don't think, to hear bad news. And we've been hearing a lot of it. Somebody mentioned to me, I don't know if it was in the congregation or outside, um, and said, you know what, I, I don't hardly ever hear good news anymore. I mean, it used to be that our you know, our local news and everything, we try to mention a good story and, and, and just really try to encourage people. We hear very little of that anymore. It's just like, it's like a barrage of just bad news over and over again. I even, I Googled this, um, this past week and there's, there is web page after web page of jokes about bad news. I, I thought I'd share a couple with you this morning. Uh, my friend told me that he had good news and bad news, and I said to my friend, just tell me the good news. He said back to me, your car's airbag works perfectly. A man went to the doctor, and now some of these are a little bit morbid, but just bear with me. That's, that's a little, you know, I have that sense of humor sometimes. But uh, I went to the doctor, and the doctor told this man, a man went to the doctor, and the doctor told this man, sir, I have bad news for you. You are going to die soon. The man said, well, that is just absolutely terrible. What am I supposed to do? The doctor said to him, you should take three mud baths every single day. The man said, well, how is that supposed to help me? The doctor said to him, it will get you used to the dirt. <laughs> Another one. Uh, bad, the doctor says, bad news is that you're going to have to take one of these pills every day for the rest of your life. The really bad news is that I'm only giving you three. <laughs> and just just one more. Um, just bear with me a little bit. Um, a businessman from Wisconsin went on a business trip to Louisiana. Upon arrival, he immediately plugged his laptop computer into the hotel room port and sent a short email back to his wife, Jennifer Johnson, at her address, genjohn at world.net. Unfortunately, in his haste, he mistyped a letter, and the email ended up going to a Jean Johnson in Duluth. This Jean was the wife of a preacher who had just passed away and was buried that very day. The preacher's wife took one look at the email and promptly fainted. The email read, Arrived safely, but it sure is hot down here. 
<laughs> Not the kind of news that you want to get. I, I, if you're, if you remember, I, I, it's almost, it's maybe over 20 years now when there was a huge panic about Y2K. Um, maybe you don't even remember what those stand for anymore, but it was such, people were, there was so much news that, you know, everything, the grid was going to shut down and everything was going to be absolutely terrible whenever the clocks turned midnight of, of that very last year of 1999. And so people stocked up on food supplies and water supplies and everything they possibly could. My, my brother-in-law and my father-in-law bought a whole tractor trailer of generators knowing that people were going to absolutely need them. Of course, midnight came, and our lights were still on. And so it took my, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law at least a year and a half to get rid of that truckload of generators that they had bought, thinking that everybody was absolutely going to need those. But the bad news that went, I mean, the same kind of a thing. People were buying up supplies of toilet paper and paper towels, and you know it was, it was going to get really bad whenever the, the midnight struck on, on 1999. We are, we are, we hate to hear bad news, and yet we're receiving a lot of it. And so whenever we hear bad news, what is to be the attitude of us as Christians? It is supposed to be an entirely different attitude than those that do not believe in God. And so I, I want to look at this, this man in this psalm here this morning. He, it says here that he has a steadfast heart. He has no fear of bad news. Psalm 111, the very last verse of Psalm 111 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. And then the first verse of Psalm 112 says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. Think about that for a moment. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Without God, boy, you're, you're really just stumbling around in the dark. There isn't understanding about the very basics of what life is all about. It, it doesn't surprise me then that unbelievers get it so wrong. They, they have not even come to the source of wisdom, the source of knowledge. They, they simply are blind to so many things. And we see that happening on a huge scale in our country. Unbelievers are, are thinking this is right, and they're absolutely upside down with it. They're calling good evil and evil good. It is the exact opposite of it. But he says the beginning of that, the fear of the Lord, is where that knowledge, that wisdom comes from. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. So the first attribute or trait of this man is that he is a God-fearing man. He wants to do the will of God for his life. He is wanting to do what God tells him to do. He wants to obey that. He is, he is wanting to do everything that the word of God says, the truth of God's word. This is not a guy that's decided, you know, I'm going to do things my own way. I want to follow the Lord. And the attributes here that are listed in Psalm 112 are the very things that make it possible for whenever he hears bad news, not to be distraught by it. He is not in, he's not fearful because of these things that God has worked into his life. Obedience is something that always starts with small things. You know, I... God doesn't call you to be a missionary to a foreign country the first week you get saved, usually. <laughs> he, there's obedience steps that he's looking for, and they're usually small things. They're not, they're not these giant steps. He's asking you to do simple, really basic things to obey him in. Secondly, this man is listed as a family man. That God's first uh, human, uh, circle of human society is the home and the family. The scripture says that if a man doesn't provide for his family, he is worse than an unbeliever. He's taking care of those things, and not necessarily just financially. He's the head of the home spiritually. He's leading his family in worship. He's leading his family to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's providing an atmosphere to be conducive for the understanding of what Jesus is all about, the amazing grace that he's brought to each one of us. He's also a good steward of all that God has given him. He's not wasting the resources. He realizes, this is not my stuff. This is God's. I'm simply a manager of it. He is also a beacon of light, even in the middle of dark times. Boy, if ever we need to be that, it's during these times. Our, our world is absolutely filled with fear. There, I mean, they're just, 
you know, this, this virus that we can't see and we, you know, and it takes a microscope to be able to detect it. We're, we're so afraid of that, of coming on us. And so many people are living every single day with the fear like that. I might get this. Christians need to be examples of how to trust God and not fear. We are placing our lives into his hands. It's not, it's not that we're going around, oh, God, help us. You know, I could die of this any moment. Christians should be the ones that are saying, you know what? No, trust God. He's the one. He's our stronghold. He's the one that protects us. He's the one that brings health to us. Trust in God. Don't fear. We are to be examples of, of what, what, a, what a person that lives for the Lord Jesus Christ is to be like. Carl mentioned on Wednesday night, I thought it was very interesting, that in the scripture it says, fear not, 365 times. We are fearful creatures. No wonder God says to us, one for every day, <laughs> you need to not fear. Trust in me. Look to me. Fourthly, he is a man that is gracious. He shows mercy to other people. He is not a person that always needs to have his own way. He is not a person who holds grudges. He is gracious to people. He's, he's, he's willing to overlook faults. He's over to look the, the, the things that they do wrong. He's, over, he's willing to overlook those things. Fifthly, he's, he's compassionate. He cares for others. And it is not all about him, all about all my need. What are others going through? I, I need to help others. Sixth, he's a righteous man. And now oftentimes you see that in Scripture, Job was a righteous man. We see that in Scripture and we think, oh, wow, that guy was absolutely perfect. That is not the case. The Scripture records men and women that are just like us. Righteousness simply means that he is trying to do the right thing as the Holy Spirit empowers him to do the right thing. None of us are capable of being good on our own. That's why we need Jesus. We don't go to heaven because we're good. We go to heaven because we're saved, because we recognize that we need a Savior. We need forgiveness of our sins. And so this guy, this guy is believing in that. He's trusting in God. He wants to do the right thing. I can just imagine he, he would get up in the morning and he would say, Lord, help me. Help me to conduct my, my, my business affairs and all that I do. Help me to do the right thing with my family, with other people. Lord, help me to do the right thing. He conducts his affairs with justice. It goes right into it. He doesn't try to take advantage of the people that he has business dealings with. Number nine, he is hated by wicked men. You know what, I, and I so think this, and you see this in place everywhere in our, in our culture today, but it is, it is a bad thing if wicked men speak well of you. I, you know, sometimes I don't always understand, you know, I don't always know all the candidates that are running politically, but I think that this is absolutely true. If people that are standing for wicked, wickedness speak well of a politician, look out. Whether I know a whole lot about the person or not, I look at the people, and if I know that people that are standing for wickedness are saying, yes, this is a really good person, then I go, no, it probably isn't a good person. If wicked people, if wicked people speak well of you, beware of that person. And so you can tell a lot about a person by the friends that they associate with. This man is hated by wicked men. They, they don't like what he stands for. The righteousness that he stands for irritates them. It goes against the grain of the way that they are living their lives. And then it says here in, in, this, in verse 7 that his heart is steadfast. His heart is fixed. In other words, he's, he's got a made-up mind. He's already decided, you know what, I... When I hear bad news, I am not going to get rattled by that. I, I'm not going to get in turmoil and, and start, you know, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know, all those kinds of things. It isn't that at all. He has made up his mind that God is going to take care of him, that God is his father, and that all of his needs are going to be provided for. He's already decided that. He's settled that in his heart. No other, it's, Satan cannot come into this guy and start convincing him, no, your father is not going to take care of you. He's made up his mind. He, he is, his heart is steadfast. He's not in turmoil at the mention of bad news. It reminds me of a passage in the Old Testament. Whenever Jacob was, ending, was coming near the end of his life, he spoke truthfully 
about the weaknesses that were in each of his children. And you can just imagine what that was like. I, I imagine, and he told some good things about his children, obviously first, the wise man. And then he said, but this is, there's, this is a problem that you have. What a way to go out and to be able to encourage your children with the good things, but also say, you know, there's some things that need to, to be improved. But of the one of one of his sons, Reuben, he said, you are strong, excelling in power. But then he said, but you are as unstable as water. <laughs> the type of person that is steadfast in the day of, of bad news is not a Reuben, is not is not the guy that's unstable and wishy-washy on every single day. He has not made up his mind about that. The person who does not fear the day of bad news is the person that's already settled that with the Lord. Lord, you know what? You have I have history with you. You have been faithful over and over again. You have supplied this need and this need. And times when I thought it was so hopeless, you came through. That person has made up the mind and up their mind and has settled that in their heart, and they've said, "You know what, God, I am not going to be moved by anything that comes along." Every time we see something in the news, there is this challenge to the very truth of who God is. I, I've told you my own <laughs> failings with gas prices. I'll see gas prices go up ten cents, and I think the whole world is falling apart. My mind, and, and, and it just goes like with very minute details of like where this could all head. And it never, it never does. I should just simply, Lord, you know what, Lord, you know what gas prices are. You know what food prices are. You promised right here in Psalm 112 that he gives food to the righteous. He gives food to his children. He takes care of that. I don't, I don't have to be worrying every single minute. Where is that? Well, how's this going to happen? How is this going to go? There, there are some things even with the church when we were going through the lockdown and we were wondering how in the world we were going to keep everybody on payroll and all those kinds of things. And, and I don't usually lose sleep, but there were a few nights and I got up in the middle of the night and I was like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> and the only way I could go back to sleep was just simply say, Lord, you know what? It's your church. It's your church. <laughs> I, I am not going to take possession of that. It's your church. You provide for your church. And he did. And he does. And so I can leave that with him. I don't, I don't have to sit up night and go, oh, Lord, look at the charts and look at the numbers and look at all of this. I just have to simply say, Lord, you're in command. You're the captain of the ship. You're the one that will provide. And so in your own household, Every single week and every single day, you might hear some bad news, and it, it might be coming down the pike or whatever the case might be, but God has promised to take care of his children. David, looking back on his life, said, you know what? I was, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm old, but I was once young, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. God's going to take care of us. David, with the perspective of age, realized God is always faithful. I don't, I don't need to be struggling with this fear inside of, God, how are you going to take care of this? God has promised to take care of it. He will honor his word. Psalm 111, and the worship team, you get ready to come. But Psalm 111, just very quickly, mentions the characteristics of God. God never, ever will let us down. He says in verse 2 of Psalm 111, Great are the works of the Lord. Verse 3, glorious and majestic are his deeds. Verse 4, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Verse 5, he provides food for those who fear him. Verse 7, the works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. And then verse 8, and in parentheses, he's talking about the same precepts. His precepts are done in faithfulness in uprightness. And so this man that has fixed his heart on God, and by doing so, he has become like the Lord. He has taken on attributes that are, are like the Lord. He knows that the Lord is good, and the Lord is always trustworthy. He trusts in that. In other words, he's saying, you know what, I, I have history with the Lord. I know what his character is like, and he is always going to see us through. 
He's not going to let us go. He's not going to leave us alone. He is going to be with us through every step of the way. He's going to provide for us. He's going to take care of us. And so whenever I hear bad news, I am not going to let that enter into my heart. I'm fixed on the character of who God is, and I'm going to trust him no matter what comes, no matter what comes to this country. I, I was talking to a, we were talking to a couple, young couple last night that we saw at, at Dairy Queen, met them for the first time, and they began to explain a lot of their, their fears, and they had two real young children. Both of them, we found out later, knew the Lord, but they were, he was really just struggling with some fears that he had in his own heart about everything that was happening. He goes, where's, where's our country going to? But he has to be reminded about what the Word of God says. That's what the news says. That's what the bad news is. But here's what the truth of God's Word is. He's trustworthy. He'll take care of you. He's compassionate. He will be the one that will be there for you every step of the way. So whenever bad news comes, <laughs> sometimes I just wonder if the news is a bad thing all the way around. Just turn it off sometimes. Your life would be 50 times better. But when you hear bad news, say, you know what? That's what, the, that's what the world says. That's what the devil says. But here's what God says. He's going to take care of me. I'm going to trust in him. I am not going to get in turmoil. I am not going to be fearing every single thing that's around me. I'm going to trust God. He's a good God. He's worthy of us putting everything of our lives into his hands. He will take care of us. Amen. Amen.